So welcome to our panel uh, titled What Blockchain Offers for Networking Community from Fundamental Research Challenges to Opportunities for its Applications. So as you know, in the networking community, we have trends over certain years, and uh, some topics become hot and emerging for a while, and it takes a few years, and then you, know, you, you see another topic picking up. So uh, in the past, it was like sensor networks, IoT, um, SDN, and now we, have, we are seeing blockchain coming up uh, from everywhere. And uh, for the last two, three years, you see a lot of applications of blockchains that started with cryptocurrencies, uh, but now it is being applied to different domains. So uh, as the networking community, um, we, we also have opportunities to utilize blockchain or to contribute to it. That's why we thought it, it would be a good idea to uh, look into this emerging topic this year in LCN. And we invited three distinguished speakers uh, who are doing research on blockchain. And uh, we will uh, start with introduction of uh, these panelists first. And then we will have questions. Uh, there will be four questions. Uh, and for each question, uh, we will also get your feedback and uh, additional questions. So I want to start by introducing our, our, our three panelists. Uh, uh, they will introduce themselves, but let me just briefly uh, provide their names. Uh, Dr. Salil Khan here uh, is from uh, Sydney, Australia. Dr. Klaus Werle is from Aachen, Germany. And, uh, and Dr. Nikita Borisov is from here, from uh, University of Illinois. So they will start introducing themselves, and then uh, we'll start questions. So I'm going to go with, uh, I guess, Salil's slides are here. So Salil, you can, you can start. <coughs> okay. Um, thanks, Kamal. Uh, firstly, for having us all here, uh, and for coming up with this very nice and interesting panel topic. So Kemal told us to keep this short. Um, I'll try my best <laughs> to stick to my five minutes. When you give academics yeah, the I know. <laughs> <laughs> stage, they speak forever, right? So I'll quickly acknowledge uh, there's a lot of people involved uh, in this research. Uh, we are, I mean, at UNSW, we are collaborating with all those institutes that you see there. and. Uh, a few words about myself. I sort of uh, started at UNSW about 12 years ago. I don't know how time went by. I'm still there. Uh, we, my initial research was on sensor networks. Um, then we started calling it IoT for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, but uh, since the past about two and a half years, we've been uh, looking at uh, blockchain in particular. And uh, coming from the IoT background, we are largely focused on how we can use blockchain uh, in the context of, as we call, cyber-physical systems, right? So the whole idea being you have a bunch of objects in the environment. They're providing you with a lot of information, uh, the, which is uh, transferred to the cyberspace. And then uh, you initiate some actuation based on the information that's been collected. And I think blockchain fits well here because there's a lot of data being collected. So there's uh, concerns around how this data is managed. Uh, there's a lot of devices. So again, uh, you have the issue of uh, scale, uh, the fact that you can easily create these distributed or decentralized networks. So in that context, I think uh, cyber, uh, blockchain fits well in this uh, space. So I'll quickly flash only briefly some slides. Uh, so we started off by looking at IoT, uh, broadly speaking, not specific to any application as such, but just broadly IoT. Uh, and we came up with this, what we call a lightweight uh, scalable blockchain. Uh, the idea being that you could, I mean, the problem we have we are trying to solve is with IoT devices, uh, there's a lot of security problems. Uh, it's pretty easy these days to install malware on these devices. Uh, so firstly, the issue of access control, who gets access to these devices. Uh, secondly, the issue of uh, creating some sort of uh, ledger of 
uh, the device to device communication because as we move forward there's going to be a lot of devices talking to each other and there might be a need to sort of go back and see how those interactions actually happened for example if your house got robbed who do you blame do you blame your uh, smart door lock or do you blame your camera for incorrectly triggering the smart door lock or whatever right so all those interactions could be locked and then that could be used uh, perhaps for insurance claims uh, and stuff like that however if you take something like the bitcoin blockchain and directly apply it here it doesn't work so you need to come up with a number of optimizations so that's what we've been doing in this space and perhaps we'll talk a bit more in one of the questions that kamal has posed uh, the second area we are working on is uh, supply chains. Uh, this is again triggered by a lot of problems that are happening, particularly focusing on food, right? Food safety. I mean, perhaps, I don't know if this got coverage here, but in Australia we had this problem just a couple of weeks back where there were some uh, people found needles inside strawberries, like actual needles, right? And this created a big problem. They were trying to trace back uh, where these strawberries were coming from. The investigation is still ongoing. We haven't yet figured out what's happening there. But I guess uh, something like, uh, and one of the main reasons is because all of the way supply chains are managed, uh, they're sort of very siloed. So each organization maintains their own databases. A lot of things are just handwritten. So there's very little digital records. So I think a blockchain could be a good way to address this and certainly there's a lot of work being done by the industry in this space but uh, in our research uh, we've uh, also been uh, looking at this problem and we have uh, a paper coming up here next month uh, which uh, talks of this architecture called product chain um, I'll skip this the idea being that you should be able to track uh, precisely where uh, the raw material, uh, the key raw ingredients uh, for your food items came from, right? So in this picture, for example, if you buy a chocolate bar at uh, whatever shop, it's got a QR code. So if you scan this QR code, you should then get a, you should be able to pull out the entire ledger of how the uh, product actually, or say the key ingredient, say the where the milk came from, where the cocoa came from, where the uh, item was actually produced, how was it shipped, and so on and so forth, right? And with the integration of IoT sensors, uh, this can also give you valuable information about things like what temperature the products were transferred, uh, maintained at as they were transferred, and so on and so forth. A third area that we are working on is uh, the connected vehicles uh, space. So we wrote this article last uh, last year, late last year. It got a lot of coverage. This was largely uh, inspired by the uh, accidents uh, that were happening with Uber test cars and whatever, right? So we looked at this problem and started thinking, okay, how do you figure out who to blame, right? Particularly in the context of driverless cars, because it's not just the driver. There are the software that's running on these vehicles. Uh, there's maintenance happening, um, so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of players involved here. So the question is, can we again use the blockchain to keep a record of all the interactions that are happening with the vehicle and so on and so forth. So we came up with this uh, architecture which we call BFICA, uh, as a short form. And I, I can talk a bit more later, but uh, essentially this uh, keeps a record of all the interactions happening and then uh, the insurance company or the police can go and investigate pull out all these records. You can embed sensor data into this, things like images or uh, video clips that were captured by dashboard cameras and so on and so forth, and use that to do some sort of vehicle forensics. And I believe even Kamal's group is doing uh, some similar work in this space. But there's more, so uh, that's not all. We are also looking at uh, the concept of a IoT data marketplace. Uh, and here, essentially, you can use the blockchain to set up trades uh, of uh, IoT um, data from the uh, supplier to the uh, consumer, and you can even sort of handle the payment uh, through an underlying cryptocurrency or some, some tokens, essentially. We are looking at uh, the smart grid space. Uh, this is, again, largely driven by the fact that it's pretty easy these days for just any household to install solar panels and start uh, generating electricity. 
And rather than sell this electricity back to the uh, grid, uh, the electric company who may not give you a, the best price, there is a potential to actually sell this energy to your neighbors, right? Um, so that's where blockchain could also be useful uh, to sort of set up a decentralized marketplace for energy. We are also working with a company who's doing uh, some providing digital services for construction companies. If you look at how the construction companies works, they're fairly outdated. A lot of things are happening on paper. Uh, you would be surprised at uh, how, how they manage some of the stuff they're doing. So again, leveraging IoT and blockchain in this space uh, could be quite useful. And then on a slightly different tangent, just last year, towards the end of last year, we actually ran a very interesting cryptocurrency loyalty program, right? So instead of getting miles like you get when you fly, the idea was, could we offer cryptocurrency? So we used Ether in this case. Uh, when, when you buy a coffee, essentially, rather than you getting a coffee stamp, you get a, some Ether uh, for that transaction. And we ran this trial. We had about 200, uh, 180 participants. Uh, we ran it for about four weeks, and we got some very interesting results. So if you're interested, you can check out. Uh, we have a nice video there uh, about this. Uh, we have a bunch of papers. I mean, um, you can. Uh, ping me, uh, some of this should be online anyway. Um, that's just a snapshot. And of course, you can't go wrong with uh, Dilbert, so I'll leave this as we transfer to Klaus. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, good morning. So, um, thanks for inviting me. My name is Klaus Werle from RWTH Aachen University. Um, I'm head of the communication and distributed systems group there. And uh, of course, we are not only doing blockchain or Bitcoin. So uh, actually, we are doing more networking research. But uh, I called it in Asian times. Uh, so 12, 15 years ago, I did a lot of research in peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, scalable, massively scalable distributed systems. And um, so basically blockchain is the remainder from that. So uh, um, I still love that topic, um, but uh, uh, of course uh, also other interesting topics are out there and, and we pursued them, but um, so still blockchain with this massively and scalable uh, distributed manner is quite interesting. So uh, what we are doing is uh, we actually take a critical look at uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, so, um, does it actually provide uh, what it uh, what it wants to provide? Um, um, is it uh, really uh, doing that what you want? Does it have vulnerabilities? Can they be fixed? Um, and uh, how is the actual usage of it? So, uh, as I will show in the next in one of the next slides, we did analysis of uh, content in black blockchain and not just the transactions, but other content uh, that could be inserted and. Maybe for computer scientists, that's not a problem, but for a lawyer or for uh, legal guys, that's actually uh, quite severe. Uh, and then we are also looking in new application scenarios um, for and with distributed ledgers. So same as Salil is doing, um, we have also quite interesting use cases. And I will also show how we use it in teaching um, to yeah, push a bit our students um, to think about, again, distributed systems. So one of the first things we did is um, um, a check of anonymity in Bitcoin. Um, so actually it promises, um, this is the pointer. Uh, so actually it, if you do transactions in Bitcoin, uh, it should be anonymous. So you should not be traceable. But uh, not us, but others have shown that uh, if you deeply check uh, the transaction log and so forth, uh, you can actually um, trace back um, certain users or can tra trace back transactions with certain users. Um, and here uh, with um, a coin party, we did an approach um, to actually achieve anonymity, anonymity um, um, with that transaction. So um, there are several approaches, centralized mixes or decentralized mixes. Um, and um, we actually uh, wanted to first go for decentralized mixes, but then um, realized a centralized one, but uh, with secure multi-party computation, we could achieve um, that uh, if these users do transactions, we put them in a pool, and, and SMC, with SMC-based techniques, um, we can still um, keep the anonymity. 
Okay, so what, that was our first thing uh, that was mainly done uh, by Henrik Ziegeldorf, one of my, my students, he already finished. Um, and then um, Roman took over and said, um, we know that there is not only transaction content in the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, but there are also other things like pictures are inserted um, or other things. So uh, we should actually check what's in there. Um, and since content you put into um, a blockchain should stay there. That's actually one of the, the basic features that it provides. So, um, and since all the users, if they want to use um, the blockchain, they have to maintain a full uh, copy locally on the disk. So um, if some malicious user wants to put some yeah, objectionable content into it, um, actually every user uh, will get that content and that could actually have um, really legal problems. So we did a thorough analysis um, on it um, and found several um, yeah, pieces of content, different classes. So the first one were uh, privacy violations. So people have been doxxed. So private information of them have been leaked um, into the blockchain. And then you cannot get them out. So if you want to blame people, um, a blockchain is actually a good uh, way to do it and uh, they cannot do anything against it. Um, second thing is uh, politically sensitive content. So um, of course with massively distributed systems we have a good technique for anti-censorship um, but um, typically you have two parties. One party says that's something good, the other party says that's not good. So um, uh, there have been uh, WikiLeaks, uh, WikiLeaks uh, content been found in the blockchain, um, other state secrets, and so forth. And depending which state you ask, uh, they are not so happy about that. Um, and the third uh, content we found in that um, have been yeah, things like yeah, condemned content, so content that is not legal in certain countries, typically religious texts. So depending on which religion um, uh, you are looking at, there are certain states that actually consider the usage or the having such content as uh, illegal. Um, then we found some images or, uh, yeah, that was not, not that big problem, but borderline images where uh, um, certain states say uh, you should not own something like that. But the most severe thing we found were something like more than 200 links to child pornography. And uh, that is in most states um, very illegal and if you own um, links to such things and these links are in the blockchain, um, then the usage of that um, is illegal. Okay, so we did a thorough analysis. It was published um, at the Financial Crypto Conference early this year and actually the result of it was that um, it was such a rush through the world press and uh, when they heard child pornography and Bitcoin, two buzzwords came together uh, and uh, for one week our phones didn't stop to ring uh, and it was amazing. Um, okay, so actually we are looking at, uh, we also looked into how can you avoid that or how can you probably get the content out of it, so rather avoiding it because what's in the blockchain cannot get out of it, so first you could use um, uh, filtering. That's intuitive, but not really effective. Um, other thing is that since this content has mainly been, or the biggest chance to get content in, illegal content in, is use uh, blockchain identifiers. Um, and you can change the way how these identifiers are handled, but um, that is actually quite severe um, or quite strong uh, or quite an effort if you want to do that. So our suggestion was that we actually um, have mandatory minimum transaction fees per transaction because usually when you put content in, you also have to pay transaction fees and the larger the content is, the more transaction fees you have to pay. So we could show that this is quite a simple strategy. Um, it puts a strong penalty for yeah, non-transaction, non-Bitcoin uh, insertions. Um, but for the usual transactions of bitcoins, um, it doesn't affect um, those transactions. Okay, um, and then this here is an interesting thing we did in teaching. So we have an honor class where undergraduate students are talking about actual research and uh, try to uh, yeah, 
we, we tried to get them into that and, uh, and we did one uh, on a class on blockchain. And actually one group of undergraduate students then um, developed um, an interesting concept for smart contracts um, to do automatic car insurances or the handling of car insurances. If you have an accident, um, then that's automatically processed, so a bit like what Salil showed. Um, and very interestingly, they wrote down a paper in it, we helped them, and that will be presented at the Globecom um, Bitcoin workshop in December. So also for teaching and teaching them distributed systems concepts, I find it quite interesting. Okay, and uh, lastly, so what uh, do we really need the blockchain? Um, of course, it's, um, it's quite an effort to do this. And uh, of course, the, the blockchain is some matter of trust or some technique to achieve distributed trust of untrusted parties. Um, but the synchronization is quite uh, heavy. So you need a full, at, today you need uh, to have the full history of all transactions. You need to verify them uh, to ensure correctness. So um, especially early information, early transactions, which have consecutively been proven all and over again, um, I find that um, yeah, too heavy. And uh, what we are looking at at the moment is how can we simplify all this and uh, make the blockchain technique a bit more slim, also to get rid of this heavy and, yeah, in my point, ridiculous effort for mining um, to only focus on the current state that is needed, but still achieve the trust that the blockchain is um, achieving today. Yeah. Thanks. You can keep it. Thank you, uh, Klaus. Uh, now, uh, Nikita will in introduce himself and his uh, research. Go ahead, Nikita. Hi. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really interested in having this discussion about blockchain and networking. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about, about myself. Um, overall, my research has been focused on uh, issues of privacy and confidentiality in various internet protocol settings. And uh, it's covered a range of topics. So I looked at just overall securing network protocols. I did some early work on the security of 8211 Wi-Fi protocols, looking a lot at end-to-end -end encryption in various type of applications, such as uh, uh, secure chat or uh, encryption for end-to-end -end encryption for social networks. Um, a whole lot of my work focuses on the topics of anonymity and metadata privacy. This is a way for people to communicate online without leaving a trace about who's talking to whom that uh, can be examined by other people. Uh, a lot of it has been done in the context, for example, of the Tor Anonymous Communication Network. Um, a few other things uh, looked at things such as uh, side channels and covert channels that exist in network communication and how they can be used for things like tracing people through networks, uh, identifying what uh, uh, information about uh, application content, even in encrypted communication, and so forth. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, starting once again in the ancient times, I did work on security and privacy in the context of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, you'll notice that uh, this list doesn't mention uh, blockchain and doesn't even mention networking as such. So I'm not really a networking researcher. I'm not really a, a blockchain researcher. But I think that some of my uh, previous work and some of my current work has an interesting, hopefully offers an interesting perspective on the intersection of blockchain and networking. Um, in particular, um, I want to tell you just briefly about some of my old work on using peer-to-peer -peer networks for anonymous communication. The work that we were doing is that you want to be able to forward network traffic through a collection of volunteer nodes, and this, there's a large network of them. And you want to, you don't want to use all of them because there may be thousands. You want to pick a few random ones to forward your traffic. Um, so there's, uh, you have to uh, do 
this selection of random nodes in a secure fashion to make sure that the nodes you're picking are not biased. Somebody is not directing you to nodes that they themselves run, in which case they can break your anonymity. And at the same time, you need to be able to do the selection in kind of an oblivious fashion, in a way that nobody else knows which nodes you're using because that defeats the uh, the privacy goals of the protocol. And um, some of the work that we've done really uh, shows the tension between these two things. This, uh, the fact that you need to both have a way to verify that what you're, uh, the nodes you're using are correctly chosen and while doing this in kind of a secret hidden way. Um, I don't want to tell you too much about how we solved this problem other than that largely it was based on various techniques using uh, DHT-like networks and random walks. Um, the thing that I want to tell you about is that um, the, one of the biggest challenges here is dealing with civil uh, attacks. As nodes, the issue is that if you have a decentralized network of a bunch of participants, you can have other people join this network, and they can join with multiple identities and essentially overwhelm your network. I can, instead of being just Nikita, I can be, you know, a million different Nikitas, and when you pick random nodes to uh, work through, you uh, will likely go through nodes that I control. Um, and in our work, we used a number of approaches. Uh, so uh, some of their work was focused on using IP addresses, which, uh, uh, gives you some limits on these kind of attacks, but not really satisfactory ones because uh, IP addresses are literally a dime a dozen if you try to purchase them in the bulk. Uh, we worked on trying to use social relationships uh, in this context. Uh, and uh, I even had a paper back in 2006 on using proof of work for addressing civil attacks. And this paper, in fact, used chained proof of works and some uh, entangled relationships between them. I think, uh, keep thinking to myself, you know, had I only added a notion of coins to it, I could have a few thousand more citations and a few million more bitcoins. Um, uh, but anyway, so one, I think, interesting thing about permissionless blockchains is that they have, at least uh, empirically, uh, given solutions to uh, Sybil attacked by tying participation to something that's uh, a, comp a hard to get resource. Uh, so the idea behind Bitcoin was that you have one CPU <laughs> gives you one vote. Of course, that's shifted to GPUs and ASICs. Uh, proof of stake protocols are developing with this idea that people, you can stake some money for a vote. And in both cases, your, uh, your ability to create arbitrary numbers of identities and influence the network this way is limited. So my current research is trying to understand, can we use these types of uh, Sybil limitations that are provided by permissionless blockchains, proof of work and proof of stake, created in this uh, uh, blockchain type uh, scenario for anonymity. And this, of course, means that we need to figure out how to use this information in a private but verifiable way. Um, and then on the flip side, can we use this to create uh, peer-to-peer -peer networks that are used in the blockchain, so they replace the peer-to-peer -peer component of blockchain designs with something that is more resilient to various types of attacks uh, so that you can ensure that all the blocks get distributed to everybody in a timely fashion. Uh, at the same time, maybe even uh, provide better, stronger privacy properties than the current blockchain offers so that you can hide where a transaction originated. Um, and the second topic that I'm working on is uh, trying to use smart contracts to uh, build protocols with uh, rational attack models. Um, and so this comes from an observation that in uh, when we build secure distributed systems, uh, one of the things that we always do is we need to do verification to make sure that everybody is following the protocols. And a lot of big part of the protocol design is trying to figure out how do we detect 
misbehavior and how we react to it. So if, you know, in a protocol, if somebody is misbehaving, you can say, okay, I'll no longer talk to that person. Um, one insight that we had a number of years ago uh, when we were working on some research is that if you can not only detect misbehavior, but also prove to others, to third parties, that misbehavior has occurred. So if you have a person commit to their operations and offer things like digital signatures, then you can not only react to their misbehavior, but you can punish their misbehavior. For example, in uh, uh, design we have, we said if we can show, demonstrate misbehavior, we can kick out somebody from the network entirely, and so that disincentivizes dis misbehavior. Uh, but this only really works if you have persistent identities. If uh, I can, if you kick me out, and I can come back as Nikita with you know a uh, mustache and a hat, then it doesn't really uh, offer any meaningful punishment. So the work we're doing now is trying to figure out: uh, Can we use smart contracts to? Uh, incentivize correct behavior by imposing a cost on misbehavior. And so in the case where misbehavior can be proven, it can be verified by a smart contract and therefore it can impose a financial cost. And so an early work in that direction is uh, we built a incentive compatible off-chain consensus protocol. And the idea is that it we can run, have a bunch of nodes run consensus without interacting with the blockchain, without the overhead that it imposes. But if anybody misbehaves, this behavior can be reported to a smart contract and therefore punished through a financial cost. So those are some of the blockchain and networking problems that I'm thinking about and I'm looking forward to discussing more of them. Thank you. Um, Nikita. So after this introduction, we are starting our questions and discussions. I want to start with Nikita first, as he did a lot of uh, distributed systems and peer-to-peer -peer networks in the past um, that will relate uh, our networking community to uh, blockchain research. So my question is, how can networking research help to build the foundations of blockchain since it heavily depends on the distribution system. So I'll start with Nikita and the others can um, add more later. So let's keep uh, uh, this discussion uh, five minutes um, per person at most. Yes, so you know, one of the reasons why I agreed on this panel is uh, to be on this panel and I was excited to come here is that I think there are a lot of opportunities for uh, networking research to impact uh, blockchain design. Uh, I mean, one interesting thing about blockchains in general uh, is that they involve, they kind of have cut across a whole bunch of uh, computer science areas from computer security to game theory to mechanism design and so forth. And networking and distributed systems are a core part. Um, in distributed systems, I think there's actually been a lot of work to try to bring existing ideas and new ideas uh, on distributed system design into the context of blockchain. So you will see that there's been a number of consensus protocols proposed to replace Nakamoto consensus. And at the same time, there have been a number of um, Oh, people are working on both the theory behind building consensus protocols for blockchains and practice and practical implementations that have different properties that might be more efficient, that might be more resilient, and so forth. So the distributed system community has engaged, I would say, quite a bit. Um, I think from a networking standpoint, there are also a lot of potential opportunities to influence the blockchain. And one of the things that, if you look at the analysis of and the design of blockchains, is that they essentially rely on this idea that you can create a network and you can distribute information from any point in the network to any other point in the network. And that's a fundamental, uh, you know, this kind of broadcast type uh, technology is essential for the blockchain operation. At the same time, if you look at the actual technology that's being used in blockchain designs, it's kind of ancient. It's, you know, you take these, uh, there's, uh, 
these uh, peer-to-peer algorithms that have been proposed, you know, 15 years ago, slightly tweaked and so forth. Um, the peer-to-peer algorithms that were designed kind of with file sharing in mind. Uh, so, uh, and I think that there are opportunities to try to think about how to achieve uh, the properties that, that these kind of network broadcast protocols need for a blockchain in a much more informed way. So when I talked about, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in is trying to understand the security of this a bit better because that's the area where I come from. So there's been a number of studies that show that there are attacks that are possible that can, say, slow down the propagation of uh, blockchain information or maybe even uh, what are called eclipse attacks where you isolate uh, somebody from a uh, large part of the blockchain, and then you can present them a different view from the main consensus. But I think from a networking perspective, there's also a question of how do you provide something that is resilient, that is robust, and that is uh, has uh, high performance guarantees. So uh, one of the uh, the, this ability to distribute information and do this broadcast is in fact one of the key limiting factors in the scalability of blockchain. So it's the faster you can get information out to everybody, the essentially shorter your block time can be and faster uh, and higher throughput operation of your, of your blockchain can exist. And there's some initial research that I've started seeing on thinking about things like essentially uh, an analog of uh, content distribution networks, kind of block distribution networks that exist to speed this along. But I think there's a very large design space for how you create uh, these networks, how you implement forwarding, how you uh, react to outages, how you structure them. And it hasn't been, uh, in my, my opinion, addressed enough by the academic com community. And so I think this is where I see the biggest opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Klaus, you want to add? Yeah. So in my perspective, um, my group is called Communication and Distributed Systems. So actually, I should cover both areas. Uh, but uh, when I take a look at it, um, what is actually the, the focus of each area? So then seeing in teaching and, and also in the discussions. Um, the distributed systems people are more, let's say, thinking more academic. They're thinking more in theory. They're thinking more abstract. Uh, they do not really care about performance, only in complexity theory. Uh, and the networking people, they are all about throughput, latency, um, getting the last uh, percentage out of the network or of some, some, some principle. And if you take a look, a look at the, inter the internet, um, people avoided a lot um, things that caused performance flaws and so forth. At some point, like uh, congestion control, they had to get some distributed algorithms in, in order to get it work. So um, I think there are two types of thinking here, communication and distributed systems. I think both can benefit from each other. So. Um, let me get back to the ancient times of peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems. Um, when DHTs have been invented, it was a really nice principle. But um, you could see that uh, if you really run them and um, do not really care about uh, the overlay and the underlay mapping, you can get a real worse, you can get a bad performance. So at such points, then both communities get, can get together and can find uh, techniques um, how you can improve both. So in order to make a theoretical algorithm, uh, which proves to be a log n or something complexity, really achieve that and not lose performance. And on the other hand, um, uh, the networking people can, can benefit in thinking of really scalable, uh, thinking in algorithms, thinking in complexity theory and so forth. So getting back to blockchain, I think um, here they can learn from each other and uh, we can identify, for example, at Bitcoin that there are techniques like the mining business uh, where we can really find improvements and not just thinking theoretically and in, in, uh, um, in distributed games and so forth. So who wins and uh, with that and that likelihood uh, we get such and such a distribution uh, really into practical problems and improve that. So I think there is still a lot of to do and uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Salil, do you want to add anything else? Thank you.
yeah i'll keep it short i mean um, <laughs> i i don't i kind of considered myself from the networking perspective because i don't do much distributed computing work so as uh, these two gentlemen have already pointed out if you look at uh, blockchain as such right from the networking perspective there are three four essential things one is the p2p network which um, both of them have discussed second being the security aspects again for that we kind of if you look at what blockchains are doing they're using pretty standard uh, cryptographic primitives um, and th those will keep i, ho I hope they'll keep uh, updating those as we come up with new standards and the third aspect is how you store the data essentially the uh, whether it be a ledger or a dag and stuff like that so i think uh, all these sort of communities are essentially um, whatever advances are made in those communities should essentially translate uh, to what people are doing in the blockchain um, space. Uh, from the distributed uh, computing perspective, I had some interesting conversations with a colleague. Uh, so he publishes in this um, PODC, is it? The Principles of Distributed Computing. Yeah. Yeah. Pod 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 yeah. And he was telling me that if the original Bitcoin paper had been submitted to that conference, it would have been rejected <laughs> because there's very little theory in that. There's very little evaluation. Um, maybe Satoshi did submit. We don't know because we don't know who he is. But uh, that, that's something interesting I found that, uh, um, and as uh, Nikita kind of mentioned, they're more focused on the, the theoretical aspects. Um, so perhaps, yeah, there needs to be some rethinking, I guess, and consideration of how uh, they may also contribute uh, to this field. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at this point, I want to ask if, if there's any question or comments from the audience uh, related to this question. Okay. So we're moving on to the second question. And uh, I want to start with Klaus here. So, Klaus, do you think the future internet architectures will be influenced by blockchain? And additionally, how will new blockchain approaches be influenced by new network architectures? Yeah, okay, so what is the, the most recent development or the most active development in the internet? So we will see the internet becomes 50 years next year, so uh, it's not that new, uh, and it hasn't seen that much um, of let's say, change and adaptation in, in over these 50 years, but let's say five to, to eight years ago, um, some radical change started, and that's um, the softwareization of, of the internet and uh, making it much more flexible in the core. So with software-defined networking um, uh, and so forth, we have now the way to really influence this. Um, this is going on. Um, network functions are being deployed. Um, we can run things in the network um, and that on a really performant uh, way. So how can blockchain help there? Um, if you really take a look at these things, um, they only typically happen in, um, in, in one domain. So if you want to run, we call this a network application, if you want to run such an application, which is an end-to-end -end service, usually um, you have to deal with all the, um, the domains that are on the path, uh, and it's quite critical to do that. Um, how can blockchain help here? So you have independent domains where you want to run things in that domain. Um, and it's a bit like untrusted parties. So if you take a look at BGP, that people do not, uh, domains do not trust each other. Uh, there are tons of papers on uh, what happens with all that BGP rules um, and how they influence each other. So we have independent parties with not much trust. Then you can think, okay, what is blockchain offering us? Um, that could be a way, a, a case for smart contracts. There could be a case for logging, uh, proving, um, as you proved with the chocolate, uh, you could prove that provider A did not really behave like it should have, and so forth. So that's the one direction of the question. Uh, the other one is, how can blockchain um, benefit from recent developments in networking? Uh, and again, would refer to um, SDN. So um, since before my ancient years in peer-to-peer -peer systems, I did my PhD in quality of service, uh, which uh, happened to die 
quite afterwards. So, yeah. uh, uh, but it's coming up again. So, uh, but why didn't it really succeed at those, those times? Because people were quickly then talking about active networks and boy, what flexibility would we have if we could place code in the network? Sometimes, somehow we have it now, but we do not have it as it was anticipated at those times. So that you download code snippets into routers and they run there uh, because uh, providers were afraid of that. Um, the, in my opinion, why SDN succeeded is because it has a limited, a limited um, uh, flexibility and a limited uh, expressiveness. So you have these match action based rules. So it's a very simple way of execution um, which you can easily prove. So there are lots of papers on the proof that um, SDN rules do what they're uh, supposed to do. Uh, the engines can easily be um, evaluated and so forth. So it's not downloading Java code to your router. Um, it's a lim limited expressiveness. And that could be a good case for smart contracts where you do not have um, um, arbitrary code which you execute, but you may take the same um, way of executing things and uh, realize smart contracts on that. So that's my suggestion. Okay, anybody would like to add more? Yeah, I think I pretty much echo with what Klaus said. In fact, your notes kind of reflect what I had here. So the concept of uh, yeah the smart contract right a self executing piece of code sort of where you could do if this then that i think that can be very useful um, in management of networks particularly as Klaus said beyond i mean you can do a lot of stuff within an autonomous system using a basic sdn network but once you start going outside that right and you have this trust issues i think uh, blockchain offers a very nice platform uh, the fact that it's trustless in a way so things like what you could do potentially for fault management is maybe you take some sort of snapshot of the network conditions and you hash it into the blockchain. Uh, so at a later point in time, if you need to trace back and figure out what went wrong, that could be a nice uh, way to sort of try to assess what exactly went wrong in the network. You could use it for various sort of configuration managements. You could use it for enforcing SLAs across uh, different providers, uh, again, the smart contract, I think, offers a lot of flexibility in, in doing so. So, yeah, um, that's all I have to add. Nikita, you want to add more? <clears throat> yeah, so I think that there's a, um, an opportunity for the Internet architecture and the Internet protocols to be influenced by, in particular, this notion of, uh, pr of uh, uh, permissioned blockchains, where essentially distributed ledgers. We're already seeing some core technologies rely on that. So if you look at uh, 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 browsing security, that is starting to rely on this concept of certificate transparency, where there's essentially uh, something like a blockchain that keeps track of all the certificates that have been issued. And uh, there's a similar efforts being deployed for uh, something called RPKI, which is uh, used to keep track of who in a, a given, uh, uh, who owns a given IP address block so that it can be used for securing routing. And, and I think that this is a, a very nice application of, of blockchains. There might be other areas where uh, it can be used. Um, I, on the flip side, I actually, um, I, I thought for a while about whether this more decentralized concept of uh, permissionless blockchains um, can uh, uh, be useful for future internet architectures. And you can certainly envision internet designs that way. But um, my experience, and you know, I've been at some meetings where people uh, try to figure out how to build things like secure routing and improving BGP and so forth with in both academics and industry, is that there seems to be a lot of, uh, you know, one of the things that you know, makes the internet work today is not just the, that we have good algorithms for running the internet through distributed systems approaches, but also that there's a whole lot of management that goes into trying to get everybody to work together. And so I feel like there's a place for 
automation, there's a place for smart contracts, but there's, but I don't see a vision where all of the human and business relationships are completely automated away and completely uh, replaced by blockchain technology. Okay, thank you very much. And again, any questions, any comments are welcome. Don't hesitate. So we're moving to number uh, three, question number three. And uh, here I want to start with Salil. So the question is, uh, what ne networking or IoT or Industry 4.0 applications can be best benefit from blockchain features? Yeah. Uh, so I think some of us already talked about uh, some of the applications there. Uh, but if you look at blockchain essentially, right, uh, it kind of gives you a sort of layer of trust over which you can run um, a number of applications. So I think uh, there are a lot of broader applications, uh, things like even DNS, right? We all know some, there are occasionally some problems that uh, we face with uh, attacks on these uh, DNS servers. So I, I do know there's some research going on which is exploring how you could uh, perhaps implement DNS using blockchain. The same could apply to say, PKI architectures where we kind of rely on a central authority. And again, we've had instances where people have issued fake certificates and that have created a lot of problems. So perhaps uh, there is scope to use blockchain uh, to avoid those uh, sort of issues. Uh, looking at, um, I mean, if you think about it anywhere where you're engaged in a contract, like even in our day-to-day -day activities, right, let's say, you rent an apartment, so you signed a rental contract, then you have to go and sign contracts with the energy company, with the electricity company, so on, telephone company, internet company. Now if you think about it, this could potentially be op uh, automated, right? Once you set up your rental contract, you could have a smart contract that says, okay, once this is in place, go and create a contract with the various utilities, right? So I think it could benefit even various things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, even, say, health records, though I know the health records are quite sensitive and there are some uh, issues that we need to address before we start putting it into the blockchain. But potentially, if that can be addressed, uh, let's say you go to the doctor, you go to um, get a surgery done, that could you could have a smart contract that says, okay, the surgery has taken place, uh, the insurance company gets sort of uh, notified, and then you can put in the insurance claim automatically. So there's no paperwork involved. You don't really necessarily have to be involved. So I think there's opportunities to automate a lot of these sort of contract um, where you have two parties engaged in certain uh, contracts. Uh, beyond that, we talked about um, some of the IoT applications uh, already. Um, there's huge uh, potentials for using this for car insurance, any insurance, I would say, where some claims need to be made based on certain things happening. Uh, I think blockchains and smart contracts could be quite useful. Uh, we talked of supply chains, um, energy distribution, uh, any sort of smart home industry settings, right? Again, smart contracts uh, can be quite useful there because based on certain conditions, you can uh, initiate certain actions. So, and we are seeing a lot of activity, uh, I mean, largely coming from the stars, startup community, but also some of the big players, uh, IBM, Microsoft, they're all investing a lot of money and effort into this. Uh, at the same, I mean, sure, there are, at the other extreme, there are applications which really don't need a blockchain. Uh, I've seen a dating application <laughs> which was trying to raise an ICO, which I don't see why you would need a blockchain. So yeah, I mean, the, you need to put on some sort of sanity hat to evaluate this. Not everything needs to have a blockchain, but certainly there are uh, a wide number of applications which can certainly benefit. Klaus, you want to? Yeah, Salil mentioned actually most of the things that I thought of. Um, we are also um, looking a bit into Industry 4.0, but it's uh, it's the same as supply chain. So you have uh, um, parties that, um, of course, work together or depend on each other, 
but uh, if it starts uh, if if you have if they have problems with each other uh, and start blaming each other then it becomes important that you can prove okay i did deliver that at that time or uh, i did those that and that production with that machine so that you have a proof um um that is very interesting and then of course do automation of yeah, silly processes where you do not uh, want to put uh, human beings into the process because it's just uh, stupid work. Um, I do not want to call the insurances there, but <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, all these things can be a bit more automated. So think of a smart city. Some years ago, people started uh, brainstorming about smart cities. If you think about them, um, you have lots of processes going on there, and you do not want to have everywhere uh, somebody observing it, somebody looking at it, because there can be problems among the parties. Um, and automating that, uh, having something like a distributed ledger that is a trustful note taker in thing, then these techniques may help. They probably will not look like Bitcoin or other uh, blockchain techniques that we have today. So especially when I think of IoT, I, I like, uh, for example, the Yota um, Tangle, uh, which is an interesting example, and uh, it's not that resource consuming as other, bit, uh, as other blockchains. So there are still lots of techniques that are worth being explored. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think that, uh, um, you know, in security, IoT is a little bit of a dirty word, uh, just because, uh, you know, we've seen proliferation of a bunch of these smart devices in across all spheres of life. Um, and at the same time, when you look at it from a security perspective, there's a bit of a nightmare because, first of all, these devices are designed to be low cost, and they have not only low parts cost, but low engineering, low software engineering cost. And so you have devices that have poor security posture, devices that don't know how to update their software, and so we've already seen some initial approaches of you know compromised devices uh, being organized into botnets and so forth. The other part that makes it uh, a kind of complicated from a security perspective is the fact that um, there are a lot of uh, privacy questions that get associated with IoT. There's a few research projects around the country that are actually spending their time just monitoring, trying to understand what these IoT devices uh, uh, capture about people, uh, about people's activities, where do they send it, how secure is that, um, and, and so forth. And it, it's, it's a pretty uh, co complicated task to do this. Um, and so I feel like, um, you know, I don't think these are easily addressed problem, but I feel like one of the things that blockchain technology offers are things, uh, transparency and verifiability. And so I think the, there's an opportunity there to use this, for example, for verifiable software updates to ensure that uh, devices that you're using are can themselves figure out that uh, the particular software update that tries to address various uh, vulnerabilities can be deployed, and that you you're, you can verify that your software, your devices are running the uh, most patched, most secure versions of themselves. And then the other part is, and you know, there's a bunch of research that needs to be done to make this feasible is uh, possible auditability, trying to understand how these devices work, how they communicate, how, how they interact uh, with data, and so forth in some sort of way that can be audited without having to do these tasks of you know, monitoring devices, reverse engineering, their flash ROM, ROM and, and so forth. So I think these are interesting applications in addition to what uh, Slil and Klaus said. Thank you. Um, nice discussion. Any comments, questions? So, go ahead. Um, I, I, can, I can bring you the mic. I was just wondering in all of that, where is blockchain really needed and where is it just because it's a sexy topic and we use it? Uh, <laughs> And also, particularly if you look at the costs involved 
basically with blockchain. We can distribute it, but the energy costs of uh, of Bitcoin, for instance, are astronomical. Um, so I talked to some uh, someone who's who's running data centers in in, in the Czech Republic, and seventy percent of his energy bills is because he's uh, he's using some blockchain services there. Apart from all the other cloud services he is running, the seventy percent go to blockchain. Thank you. Yeah, excellent point. Um, and. Uh, the response, I guess, would be that uh, certainly we need to come up with uh, more stripped down versions of, uh, say, consensus protocols, which are kind of uh, addressing this energy issue. So just to give you some context in the work we did with uh, IoT, we have come up with a very stripped down version, um, which we call a lightweight scalable blockchain. And I'm, I've heard a lot of other com uh, researchers and uh, companies have also come up with uh, such similar ideas, right? So you need a blockchain that is uh, scalable, um, essentially which has higher throughput and which can keep the energy costs down in order to uh, fit into some of these applications. In con Perhaps in the context of a cryptocurrency, yeah, I mean, still one could argue what, what has happened with Bitcoin is perhaps uh, over the top, but perhaps you still need uh, in it's kind of like horses for courses, I would say, right? In some instances, you could do with much more lightweight um, algorithms. In other instances, you might still want to have something a bit more robust. So I guess there's a scale over which um, you could tune the knobs. Anybody wants to add? One? Yeah, so I, I also will not defend uh, Bitcoin that it's... Uh, uh, designed properly uh, or let's say resource efficiently um, uh, it does its task uh, and uh, it, it was designed like that but I think it's our task uh, if we want to stick to these decentralized uh, solutions that we find um, yeah more resource efficient ways of doing that uh, but you mentioned also cloud computing so that's the other opposite uh, or that's the other uh, uh, way of doing things. You do it centrally, then it's resource efficient. But how about privacy then? So think about elections. Do you want to do um, um, online elections? And uh, I just saw the movie The Circle. So uh, where everything, where the whole popular, the whole country is voting and uh, it's managed in one data center. Uh, I think you do not want to have that. So I think there are use cases, there are application scenarios where you need decentralization inherently. Um, but I, I agree to Salil, it can be designed uh, much more uh, efficiently in terms of resource consumption. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so one thing that I want to say is that the blockchain is kind of a very nebulous concept in the sense that it tries to, you know, there, there, there's Bitcoin, which is a concrete protocol, but when people say blockchain, they can mean any number of things. So depending on how you define blockchain, you can always say a blockchain is needed, or you can say a blockchain is not needed. Um, but I think there's actually a good thing that comes out of that. So in the sense that um, when... Uh, back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people were working on distributed hash tables. There was this perspective that a distributed hash table has uh, this type of property that's decentralized, that has this key space and whatnot, and, and so forth. Now, there aren't that many distributed hash tables running uh, today that have, look exactly like the designs people had proposed. On the other hand, some of these concepts filter down. And so, you know, you can say Amazon's Cassandra is a DHT because it uses, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, consistent hashing for key distribution and node, but it looks nothing, you know, it, it, it throws away a bunch of these concepts that were central to the design of DHCs earlier. And so I think the same is going to be true of blockchain. I think blockchain, you, know, you can think about this, this concept as a uh, very, uh, as, a, uh, as a, uh, a full Bitcoin style blockchain with permissionless uh, distributed ledgers and proof of work and so forth, but you can refine it. And so I think one of the interesting questions is not you know, do you need a blockchain or he, or not? But what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of, what types of blockchain technology can, uh, 
influence your particular protocol and you need to specialize them and while doing that you can much better manage the trade-offs between the functionality that it provides and things like energy costs and so forth. Okay, thank you. One, one more point? Just a quick one. So yeah, um, <clears throat> I may also refer you to, there's a very nice article by folks at uh, ETH Zurich, uh, where they've come up with this very simple flowchart, which could be, uh, which you can walk through and sort of see if you really need a blockchain or not. So I think that's a nice starting point, essentially, to start exploring whether blockchain is actually suited for a particular application. Great. Thank you, Salil. Uh, I guess this uh, next question is kind of a follow-up um, to that the issue that was raised uh, about uh, the need for blockchain and the, the challenges. So as we are all researchers here, you know, we want to find out new research problems. And the question is uh, that I uh, start with Salil. Uh, what are the main research challenges uh, of adopting the blockchain to various uh, resource constraint networks that we were discussing under the umbrella of IoT? like sensor networks, vehicular networks, or mesh networks, etc. So uh, can you comment on those research challenges so that we know, you know what directions we can look for? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a very important issue, uh, particularly as you pointed out, looking at these uh, low resource devices. Uh, I mean, so some of the work, for example, we've been doing is we've pretty much strip down the, I mean, you need some essential things. You need essentially an immutable ledger uh, that needs to be maintained. Uh, you need some form of consensus that uh, particularly because, uh, particularly if it's a very public network, say as opposed to a more permission style architecture. So you need some level of uh, consensus that's making sure that only um, the right blocks are being added. So if you can address that in a more efficient manner, uh, not like what Bitcoin does, for example, uh, I think uh, there, there is still some scope. I mean, people have come up uh, with some ideas, but certainly uh, uh, it's still open to research as to what is the best way uh, to achieve this. I mean, perhaps uh, coming at it from a theoretical perspective, which um, maybe not a lot of people have done, uh, looking at it uh, as a theoretical problem and coming up with an optimized uh, solution could be something interesting for PhD students, for example, uh, to look at. Uh, there is certainly a need to actually implement some of this stuff. A lot of, uh, particularly if you look at all these white papers, right, they propose things, but there's no real implementation or benchmarking uh, that is provided. And that's certainly needed if you're proposing a blockchain, claiming it to be scalable, it's important you provide some data points. So in that regard, uh, in our lab, uh, we have, I mean, it's a, still an ongoing process, but we do have a first version of this uh, LSP that's been implemented on Raspberry Pi class devices at the moment. And we are hoping to sort of keep improving, iterating and expanding this to even get it on say, lower class devices. I mean, some may argue Raspberry Pi is not really an IoT device, which is a fair comment, but at least that's a start, uh, right? <clears throat> um, some, sorry, um, I guess I'll, I'll stop at that and, yeah. yeah. Okay, Klaus. Yeah, so using blockchain technology in, in, in resource constrained uh, systems and networks, of course you can say researcher, researchers like to use then instead of one buzzword, two buzzwords and combine them. Um, so, of course, first you have to answer the question, is it really useful? Is it really necessary to do that? Um, but as we have said before and as we have discussed before, if you have distributed entities and uh, there's not much trust among these, and if you look in the application scenarios of Internet of Things, of um, smart cities and, and all these things, what do you have? You have systems that are deployed everywhere, um, as uh, the buzzword scenarios always claim. Um, these systems are autonomous. Um, they are probably not bound to a user, but to the environment. Uh, they have to detect things, and they somehow interact with either with people passing by, with users passing by, or with devices of others. Um, and then there is an interaction. And then um, there could be consequences of those interactions, so that which afterwards 
lead to problems where you need to prove that you did that and that or the device did that and that. So I think there are interesting use cases that you need um, trust um, enabling techniques among these distributed systems. And then of course it's the question of, okay, okay uh, they are resource constrained. Uh, what can we actually do in the research community in, in, in terms of enabling that? And of course, uh, and there I would of course, uh, agree to Andreas that uh, um, just putting techniques like Bitcoin uh, or similar things on those nodes is not useful. All the uh, computation that is burned in these mining processes is ridiculous, in my opinion, and we have to find uh, possible solutions for that. Um, some years ago, uh, we also started working on security, um, uh, which is an inherent component of um, uh, blockchain techniques uh, on these resource constraint devices. And we came up with solutions like offloading, uh, resumption, and delegation mechanisms. So um, that could be possible or potential solutions, how to cope with the resource constraintness. But of course, it's, it's a bit Counterintuitive to the to the trust and uh, uh, the trust that you want to enable. So probably delegation mechanisms are not the right thing. But uh, um, I think uh, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. We have to take a look at what we have done in the past. Uh, and of course, blockchain technology has components like security, and there there are solutions um, for the resource constraintness and so forth. And of course, there are other. Um, possible solutions instead of just using uh, the Bitcoin approach. Um, as I said, I like very much the Yota approach, um, also from an academic perspective in order to write uh, interesting papers on that and to do nice analysis. So that could be a different way of doing that. And of course, um, if you then think about smart contracts on these resource constraint devices, you have much more execution than uh, how do you do the proofs. Uh, so. I think there is still some uh, work to do, and uh, it, it's worth in looking into it. But of course, you should have a good use case, uh, which um, yeah is convincible that blockchain is a good technique, and uh, that cannot be done on the cloud or somewhere else. Um, that you really can prove that uh, you need some some distributed uh, technique for that. Uh, let me just add uh, just a tiny bit, which is that um, I've actually seen a lot of interesting developments recently in the cryptographic domain to try that can reduce some of the resource requirements of uh, blockchains. And I even saw a presentation that uses this technique called uh, you know, double snark, which I, I won't be able to explain, but to create a constant size blockchain, a blockchain that doesn't grow in size as, as things go along. And so that can potentially improve the uh, comp the storage and communication costs that are associated with blockchain. Uh, at the same time, you know, these techniques, they're new. We're still trying to figure out how to optimize them. And so the computation of them is not really practical for IoT devices. But I think there's interesting research that goes on in trying to figure out how to make these things more efficient and how to get some of the functionality or all of the functionality of a blockchain while drastically reducing all of the networking, storage, and computational costs. And I think there's uh, uh, going to be good problems there. OK, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, Greg. So I just have a comment uh, for for using blockchains in IoT local constraint devices. Um, actually, we might consider second layer solutions, uh, something like Lightning Network or Nocast, where you, like um, you can perform transactions in a much lower cost, and sometimes you don't even have to pay transaction uh, fees. And uh, the nodes themselves, they wouldn't have to deal with like they wouldn't have to store the blockchain. They just need to interact with the service provider, for example, like a, a hub in Nocast to be able to perform transactions. And these actually are implemented at the moment. And like we can use them right away to in our IoT applications. Um, also, I've been working on, on a paper actually in this conference that um, is like um, making information-centric networks able to use blockchain clients 
to to deal with that to to use them in, in ICN networks and this is would like also bridge the gap a little bit um, by making like uh, trying to achieve more throughput but this is also using a different architecture so I think there's uh, using second layer solutions is a much more achievable approach at the moment to uh, use blockchains in constrained devices can you elaborate on no cast you said no cast right no cast yeah, yeah. So no-cost is like a second layer solution using hubs instead of network, uh, instead of like a, for example, if you heard about Lightning, they use networks and you have to have collateral between every single payment, uh, on every single payment channel to be able to perform transactions for free. But then uh, to sign up for a channel, you need to do an on-chain transaction and that you, you do not need to do no-cost. So no-cost, you simply sign up with the hub and you don't need to touch the blockchain and then you perform transactions and it's non-custodian. So you just have to deposit your fees in the hub and everyone interacting with the hub, you can transact with them, but you don't need a network, you don't need to resolve um, um, like um, transitioning issues to be able to pay people you don't have already a state channel um, up and running. So I think it's pretty practical in IoT for IoT applications because you don't need to worry a lot about having funds on the chain or having to interact with a lot of, having a network, a huge network with a lot of other devices. And it's actually the tendency. So in Lightning Network, it's a tendency to have hubs where nodes are having a lot of state channels open with multiple clients and they're using these. So no cost, they use that by default to like to have payment hubs. Okay, okay thank you. Any, any follow-up co follow comments from the panelists? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know the specific uh, work you mentioned, but I think uh, even in the design we have proposed, we are kind of using a similar approach where uh, if you have like a door sensor or things like that, they're, they're not actually running the blockchain. We have uh, what we call hubs, uh, which are doing uh, all the processing and these uh, low resource devices are sort of attached to these hubs. Um, there's also the idea of microtransactions, uh, which kind of fits into what you were saying, right? Where you commit one any, particularly when you're um, doing, say, small payments. For example, if you think of an IoT data market and you're exchanging small streams of data, you're, the cost of actually um, adding the transactions to the blockchain is just going to make it impossible to actually do the trade. So there's all this work on uh, micro raid and uh, lightning network in, in the context of Bitcoin where you sort of have this uh, initial transaction that you commit and then you do off the chain transaction. So I think that, that are, these are the ideas that are essentially uh, being proposed uh, in the IoT context. Okay. You want to add more? Bob? Yeah, so uh, I, also, I always have the feeling that discussions about blockchain is very much influenced by Bitcoin. So that you think of transaction fees, where you think of real money that has to flow there. Uh, we didn't have that thinking in the ancient times of peer-to-peer -peer systems. So that was a cooperative uh, way of doing things and everybody contributed um, a possibly even share of resources into that system, into that cooperative system. And uh, thinking of IoT applications, probably you can trade uh, what you have. So if you have a resource constraint sensor, uh, which doesn't have the capabilities of doing a lot of uh, proof of work, um, it, could, it could trade its information that it gathers. So, and uh, others who are interested in that information can then uh, bring in resources in order to prove um, the correctness of the blockchain. So uh, that could be a market and you do not have transaction fees in where you think of, oh, dollars are flowing here or bitcoins are flowing here. Uh, so um, it's, I think we should think beyond that uh, yeah, boundary of thinking that everything that is called blockchain is something like Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? So. Fabian. So it's not quite related, but I, I'm going to ask anyway. So I would be interested in your opinion on the sort of lifetime management of such systems. You know, once you put those systems out there and 
potentially deploy those to sensors, to IoT devices, maybe worldwide. Um, for example, with Bitcoin, we are already seeing that once um, changes to the system are introduced or proposed, that people um, are splitting up the system, basically branching, creating a, a fork of the system because they are not agreeing. And I could easily imagine if you really put those in, in, in physical hardware devices, this problem might even be uh, getting worse. So what is your opinion on, on, on that sort of, of, of lifetime management of such systems? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, a lot of people are not considering that at the moment because this research is probably still in its infancy. But I guess uh, if we design these systems correctly, whereby if uh, you you mentioned the problem of over-the-air updates, right? That very rarely happens with IoT devices. If it happens, it's pretty crappy. So I think, uh, firstly, that we need to come up with OTA solutions uh, separately. I mean, that's independent of this issue of blockchain or not. Uh, in the context of IoT, we have to address this problem. So looking forward, hopefully, uh, once we get a reasonable solution for that, that should feed into whatever new advances uh, that are happening with blockchain. Uh, if we keep the actual functions that these very resource-constrained devices have to uh, perform to a minimum set, that would help because then the less updates you would need to make, uh, I presume. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't really have an answer to that. It, it's, a, it's a known problem. We've been facing it for, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, we have had IoT devices out there for 10 years, and you still cannot update them a lot of times. Yeah, I would agree. So uh, I think it's not a problem of, of blockchain, actually, but it's uh, it's a problem we have in many areas. Clara showed it uh, yesterday uh, with other systems uh, um, that uh, you have to think about that. And I think that could be that could raise a discussion for many application scenarios, for many techniques that are done in networking, in computer science at all, um, if you think uh, about the lifetime and beyond the lifetime of certain devices. So I do not think it's a blockchain-specific topic, yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things that uh, these uh, forks and so forth that have existed in the cryptocurrency space point out is, is issues of governance of a uh, blockchain or a cryptocurrency and so forth. And so you can see how these played out in the forks of Bitcoin and the forks of Ethereum and so forth. Um, and I think these issues are going to be even bigger once we start talking about blockchains, especially in things like IoT space and so forth, because uh, you know the there's the uh, various governance structures that uh, formal and informal that exist in the cryptocurrency spaces, but in the end, what happens is that they're relying on uh, both big and small players, miners, exchanges, and so forth, trying to decide to adopt a particular technology. But now when we're talking about millions of devices that no single person is responsible for, and the question is, when do they switch over to one fork or another, and how this is managed? I think these are actually very important questions to think about. I don't think there's an easy answer at all, but I think that's a great question, though. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we, are, we filled our time, and uh, this concludes our panel. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the panel. Thank you very much for attending. And let's thank our uh, panelists um, for their contributions. <laughs>